welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, very delighted to have you here. I am Janie Winchell, the Sarah Fraser Robbins Director of the Dottie Brown Art and Nature Center and Curator of Natural History here at PAM. And I'm also the Vice President and Program Coordinator for the Essex County Ornithological Club. And this is one of our several co-hosted programs uh, between those institutions. So you're here to see and learn from David Moon and his program, Birding and Habitat Restoration on Plum Island. And I'm so pleased to welcome David here tonight and to be introducing him. Before I do, I would like to thank the Lowell Institute for their support of this program and to remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. David Moon earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Haverford College in Pennsylvania, where he developed an independent major with a focus on avian ecology. So a long-standing interest in birds that no doubt predates the degree. He later earned his master's in environmental education from Antioch University, New England. David has been a dedicated science teacher, environmental educator, and administrator of nature center programs for 40 years. He taught at the renowned Putney School in Putney, Vermont. He also served as a dec executive director at the Ashulot Valley Environmental Observatory in Cheshire County, New Hampshire, and education director at Stonewall Farm in Keene, New Hampshire. David was the sanctuary director at Joppa Flats Education Center in Newburyport for over four years before his current position of the Community Science and Coastal Resilience Manager for Mass Audubon North Shore, which he took on almost four years ago. He is based out of the Joppa Flats Education Center, where he helps to restore coastal habitats and continues to lead bird programs, which he'll be speaking about tonight. David also works as an adjunct professor at Franklin Pierce University, where he teaches tropical forest ecology in Costa Rica, which is a great uh, opportunity for those students. And uh, tonight he's gonna be speaking much closer to home at our own special and unique ecological system uh, at Plum Island. And please join me in giving David a very warm welcome for being here tonight. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janie. It's really an honor to be here and, and speak to you about this. I've been um, bird watching on Plum Island since uh, 1979, when I was a, an intern up out of Pennsylvania at Manomet. Um, and that's when I, I've been coming back ever since, um, because there are places around the Northeast that are amazing to go birding at, but Plum Island is really in the top few. Um, and so, once moving to New England full time, it became imperative to get to Plum Island um, frequently from inland. But I wanna do something now that is fun because I developed this talk because I thought it would be safe to talk about Plum Island in the Berkshires, right? I developed this talk for the Hoffman Bird Club and um, I went there last fall and I asked people to raise their hands as I'm now asking you, raise your hand if you've been to Plum Island. Yeah, right. Okay, and it was like that in the Berkshires. But then the next question is, raise your hand if you make sure you get to Plum Island um, at least once a month. Yeah, see, look at this. And I could get a lot more people um, if I said three times a year, which is kind of what I did with them, and, and a few hands went up. Um, how many people here go there pretty much once a week? Yeah, okay. So that's who I thought I'd be speaking to, a, a crowd like that. And I get there about once a week. I lead Wednesday morning birding at, at um, job, out of Joppa Flats Education Center. Um, so I wanted to start with, obviously, not birds. Um, I just had to put these spadefoot toads on there. I just did. They, they, are, they were breeding uh, behind the, we have a banding station uh, near Wardens uh, on the island. And they were singing back there uh, when I went out to the banding station one day last spring. And, I always wanted to see one, as I'm sure many of you wish you could see if that it's working. I have to say that Mass Audubon is rather amazing. Um, Mass Audubon 
has um, a, over 160,000 members, um, which is important because of the advocacy work we do for laws and policies that protect nature in Massachusetts, which is our mission. Um, we have around 50 sanctuaries, around 22 of those are, are, are staffed. Um, it's, it's a big organization that has actually doubled in its budget uh, through the pandemic. We're doing really, really well. And a lot of that has been to, oops, I went too far, has been to focus more of our energy on dealing with the fact that climate change is coming and addressing that directly, um, but is also dealing with not just setting aside land, hoping it will be okay, but actively managing land more and more and doing ecological restoration so that we, that we have a better idea it will be okay, will be resilient um, as climate change takes place. So we're doing this resilient landscapes effort. So we have departments that didn't exist anymore in ecological restoration. Um, and we're really working very hard to include everyone in Massachusetts in what we do. So let's get to the, the reason we're here tonight to, to hear this stuff. Um, I um, am working in the Great Marsh now quite a bit. I knew I was already, but um, I really need to know what the Great Marsh is. It's a set of estuaries um, that have uh, created these barrier beaches. Primarily all the sediment that makes these barrier beaches has come from the Merrimack River, the second longest river in New England, but lots of other little rivers contribute to this and affect the fact that those barrier beaches that you see in white there um, have this enormous salt marsh behind them that is the largest salt marsh in New England. Um, you really don't find salt marshes like that until you get below New York. So, um, and it's a very different salt marsh than those. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, Mass Audubon has two staffed sites in this view, Joppa Flats Education Center up there on the Merrimack River Estuary, and then Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield. Uh, we also have Endicott Wildlife Sanctuary um, with our beautiful little preschool there, nature based preschool, but it's just out of the picture here, so I mentioned them. Okay, so um, when I'm telling you about how to go birding on Plum Island, I really feel this sense of bringing coals to Newcastle. However, um, there are a few little tricks that I've been working on that I hope are useful. And I also, in going through some of the prominent places to enjoy birds on the island, hope to engage you in pulling together more of this kind of information, okay? So when I forget or just don't even really know that well, the place that you think is the most diverse and amazing out there, um, I have a way for you to, to help share that with more people when, we're, when we get to the end of this. Um, the first thing that I wanted to do, I had a lot of things to do when I first came eight years ago. The first thing I wanted to do, I had been thinking about it ahead of time, was there was this thing that I learned as a young person that could happen with shorebirds on Joppa Flats. And there I was at Joppa Flats Education Center. Um, it was the sportsman's restaurant when I used to come up here uh, before. And then Mass Audubon came in and built this wonderful place where you can watch this stuff happen. The thing that I was taught as a young person was that there's this magic moment when all these thousands or hundreds of shorebirds are out there when Joppa Flats, the big tidal flat in the estuary the, near the mouth of the Merrimack, when that's all exposed, it goes way out where the channel of the river is all the way across that big expanse of water. There's this magic moment when all those shorebirds that are teeny little specks that you can't identify um, get pushed in by the rising tide. And so there were strategies for trying to be there at that moment. Well, you're watching that moment right here. And I thought there should be a way to predict it. And if you look at an old tide chart with, you know, that grid that kind of makes my eyes go in circles, um, but that maritime, true maritime people just read those tide charts and understand them, um, then these apps came out. And that app is what saved me so I could figure this thing out. Because some people said that you could know when the shorebirds were being pushed in to see them well um, based by uh, a calculation uh, relative to high tide in Boston, which um, would be nice if that were true and probably works occasionally, but is really not a thing. Um, what is a thing is the actual depth of the water that either is covering the tide flat or it's not. 
Um, and that depth, it turns out, I just watched uh, day after day driving to work. Okay, this is that moment. If there were shorebirds, you know, it would be now that you'd want to see that. And I get the app out and it tells you what the forecast tide for that time is. And it turns out it's really convenient. It's one foot. So there's my first little gift to you. If you get one of these apps, and there's a few of them that display the tide information in this way, um, it will tell you what the t where you are in the tide, which is kind of convenient in general, especially in this visual format that some people prefer over a grid of numbers. Um, and you can predict when to be there um, by finding out what time it will be at one foot. Because on the screen right now, it's not showing the current forecast because I had to scroll back in time to um, get this image. But when you're looking at it live, there's a red line that shows you the current predicted tide level on the gauge at the Route 1 bridge in Newburyport. And you can touch the screen and it will give you what the predicted tide is at any other time on this scale. And so you can find out when one foot's gonna happen and get there in time. And if you're leading a group of bird watchers and you say, we're getting down there for the magic moment, and then you get there at that time, it works that way, it makes you happy, okay? <laughs> it just does. And so that made me happy to figure out. Um, it can vary quite a bit by because of wind, barometric pressure, uh, sometimes even currents, but primarily if it's a calm day, this works really well. So there's a bunch of um, what look like probably, um, I don't know, that looks like plovers to me, so many palmated plovers out there, uh, flying around, but it, it really works. So those were both times, different dates, uh, when it was near about a foot on that bridge. And um, there the birds are moving all about to identify them. I personally don't think that um, that's the best time to see shorebirds. The best time is at high tide itself when they are on high tide roosts that we'll, we'll talk about. But it really is an exciting movement to see the birds moving around there. And I don't have photographs of this, but at two feet for, for a number of years, there was a swarm of small gulls in late summer at the Joppa boat ramp. So one of the things I'm inviting you all to do is think about these tidally related phenomena that we like to see, such as a group of Bonaparte's gulls hovering around over shallows at that two foot level at the Joppa boat ramp. And uh, maybe there's a, a black headed gull mixed in with them. And that's happened for our groups where we've gone down for that particular phenomena. So let's learn how to use these tides and tell each other about these possibilities that we can, we can share with each other. All right, so now we are on Plum Island. I had to do Joppa Flats first, obviously, and you could see Plum Island in the background, so it's okay. So what I'm gonna do is kind of march down from north to south and share observations of going out week after week on Wednesdays, except for July, of course, um, and what we find where, when, okay. So the north end of Plum Island is so fabulous and just amazing. Um, and Tom Wetmore's wonderful um, sharing of the, the recent sightings at Plum Island that happens you know, on a really often sporadic kind of basis where his trusted friends share with him what they've seen and he posts it. Um, not many sightings come from North End. It's mostly from the refuge, but the North End is incredibly rich um, and fantastic things happen there. So um, we do go over to Salisbury Beach State Reservation, which is not Plum Island, but certainly connected ecologically. And it's a good place for ground birds and, and crossbills in the years when we have crossbills. Um, the spots over there are, are really a very different environment than what you find on Plum Island in the horrifying winter of 2021, which nobody enjoyed. We had such a good time out there even wearing masks, you know, that were steaming up our binoculars. It was just amazing for the ground birds and crossbills that were there that year. So get there. But we typically will begin a three hour program by turning up to the north end in winter. Uh, early this year, it was kind of quiet, not much. And then it just picked up and became a really good place to go. Mainly because when you park right near where it says north end on the map there um, and walk up to the beach, uh, stuff gets really close. So you're, you're right at next to deep water where uh, lots of seabirds are moving by uh, or sitting on the water, sometimes just a few yards away. Um, what's been happening there lately is somewhere between a dozen and 35 common loons. 
what's up with that? And there's a lot of what's up with that um, in our wintering populations where we have a lot of something or none of something and there's no way to know why there's so much of something or so little of something, why it's sort of low for sea ducks for us this year, but evidently in Beverly, it's awesome. There are places where lots of sea ducks are appearing this year. Um, but one thing that is, seems to be through all the years really reliable there is close-up views of long-tailed ducks, which are fabulous and will be flying by constantly at great speed as they love to do. Um, this part of the island is getting smaller. Um, the storms this year have really taken out a lot of sand and um, it is going to sort of erode away over the next decades because of the amount of water that's having to move in and out of the um, out of the mouth of the river that is increasing all the time. Um, but here we are close to the birds that we really enjoy. Um, there was that year, I think it was 2021, when there were, we estimated at one point the peak of 5,000 black scoters were out there. It was just a staggering thing. And what was best about it was their song, their angel choir of sound that you could hear a long distance away from the water. It was really extraordinary. Um, so we're going to keep moving right along here. Um, the north end of the island, about a third of Plum Island is developed. And you can see that on here. You know, it's a funny thing, and I'm, this is where I'm reaching out to you to make comments later. The boat basin, or the, the basin there, uh, called the boat basin or the basin um, on Plum Island, has got to have a lot of neat birds in it sometimes. Um, and if anybody has a, a sort of a hack for how to get there, I, I imagine it's not that hard to go there just yourself, but I don't take groups there because there's really no place where, you know, a group of people wouldn't be trespassing and, and all that kind of thing. So I'd like to hear your observations of that because we don't use it much. So we go from the north end and hop down to parking lot one typically, uh, depending on what's happening with the season. Sometimes we bypass it pretty quickly. Other times it's a pretty important spot. And fortunately, we enjoy that for different reasons uh, in a lot of different seasons. Um, there really are special places right around that part of the island where wonderful things happen. Um, in winter, we enjoy looking at seabirds from the observation deck that is kind of still there, although you can't visit it right now. Um, there's a wonderful observation deck at the top of the ramp there. The stairs fell off in the storm in January. They're gone, um, and you're not allowed to go onto the platform right now. So you have to sort of stand there forlornly in the dunes. Um, lower down, you're not as, it's not as high up. You can't see those razor bills as well. But that's what we've been enjoying for several years now is a regular phenomenon between parking lot one and kind of north of parking lot one into the mouth of the Merrimack River of lots of razor bills. You pretty much could see a razor bill almost any day. And some days in the times when it's been really busy, um, we've had over 30 razor bills running around out there. And you start to see really cool behaviors that they do that are, are remarkable. Um, back around the parking lot uh, during spring migration, there's you know, stuff popping around. But of course, we're going to get to the best thing about parking lot one in a minute. Uh, the boat ramp there on the other side of the island um, is good for the sparrows that we look for in the salt marsh. And on days when there's a warbler fallout, a migratory concentration of birds on the island, um, the bumps that kind of look like dunes but are not called the middens, one of which I've uh, marked on this uh, photograph um, are just alive with warblers that are crowded into the shrubs there and sometimes bursting out east westward trying to get off the island into some really good forest but if there's a wind coming from the west um, they, they don't like flying against it and they turn around and come back and that's a really fun thing to watch because of how many warblers you're enjoying at that time um, but if you want if your brain has a problem, which most of us have some kind of problem in our brain, right? Um, you can make your brain better by just standing there, maybe closing your eyes even, and listening to purple martins. That's a sound that is just, I don't know, it's therapeutic. And so we love the colony of uh, purple martins that Sue McGrath uh, stewards out there with all her volunteers. And um, that's been growing really, really wonderful. Um, there are the razor bills. So there's sort of a juxtaposition of the summer and winter enjoyments at parking lot one. Um, razor bills seem to really like to be in a line. They forage in a line, they dive in a line, 
and return to the surface in a line. And one day we saw this so astonishingly that they were porpoising. A, a razor bill would surface and go under like a porpoise about that fast. We didn't see a spout or anything, but um, we did see this razor bill, another razor bill, another razor bill, all in a line, just grabbing air and going back under. Um, that thing that alcids can do, spending so much time under the water, that makes them sort of sporty to look for. But it's amazing up there when there's a lot of razor bills. Let's see if this will keep moving. There we go. Okay, so that was parking lot one, moving right along. Um, there are things to see between parking lot one and the main pan, uh, but it's all dependent on things that happen kind of stochastically that might happen or not happen. You don't know when a snowy owl is gonna be standing in the dunes up there um, or when there's a nice harrier flying around in the marsh. But um, we're really always kind of hoping and wondering what's gonna happen in the main pan. And the main pan has gotten a little bit more exciting lately in terms of not knowing what you're gonna see because of what's happening um, with the management of the marsh there, okay? And so we'll take a look at that. This will progress for me. Come on, you. There we go. Um, so here's the main pan. Um, a salt pan is a natural, naturally occurring pool of water on the salt marsh surface. Uh, they can sort of get formed in places where rack tends to build up, killing vegetation sometimes. And um, then there can be some subsidence of the level of the salt marsh that develops into a pool that sticks around for a long time. Um, what's been happening, as we'll talk about at the end of this program, is that uh, pans and pools, whichever you're going to call them, um, really are expanding on the marsh and killing a lot of vegetation, and it's the beginning of losing our salt marsh. So, um, so managing a big pan like this is actually something of interest. Um, this pan was, if you might have, if, um, many of you, I think, have been around here for a little while. Um, so you know that years and years ago, in spring migration, fall migration, the main pan was a great place to see shorebirds, um, especially if it was morning and the light was coming from behind you and the birds were close and you could see things. And I'll never forget that rough that was out there that year. Um, in any case, it's a great place to see shorebirds until it wasn't, right? Remember that period of time when it wasn't a great place to sh see shorebirds? It was okay for ducks if it was duck season, um, but it was just too full of water all the time to see shorebirds. And that's because it was plugged up. So my friend, Nancy Powell, who's the refuge biologist and who's working to restore salt marsh along with a lot of other scientists that we're working with, um, unplugged the ditch plug and re restored natural tidal flow um, and drainage to the main pan. So now uh, the main pan is a fantastic place for shorebirds again. And we're going to see that next if it'll go. All right, let's switch to the next slide, please. There we go. So it's wonderful now. And if you're teaching people, as I do, a lot of newcomers um, in Wednesday Morning Birding and other programs, um, it's, you want them really close so they can find out how they can start to perceive these really subtle differences, such as white rump sandpipers and things like that that can be really hard for beginning bird watchers to perceive. So um, it's become a really good shorebird place, but you can do it. All right, there we go. But tides matter. So this is another place where I encourage thinking about tides because if it's been a particularly high tide, the, the image I have on the screen now from the Tide app is another view of the data that is extremely helpful because when it's just numbers in a grid, um, some of those numbers are bigger than other numbers, the highs and the lows. Um, but what this shows you in a graphic way is the waxing and waning of the tide. Uh, neap tides are when it's narrow there, it doesn't go very low or very high. And then spring tides are when it goes very low and very high. And you can scroll through it really quickly and find the king tide of the year, the highest tides of the year, which in, in the case of our area are coming this fall. Um, in the past year, we didn't have any king tides officially during the day. They came at night, so I didn't hold any king tide programs. Um, but we'll have them again next fall during the day, and we'll get out there and look at the whole marsh being flooded. Anyway, if you pay attention to that, and you're thinking, I'm going to show people 
shorebirds at the main pan, if there's been a super high tide the night before, you're not going to show people shorebirds there because it'll take it a while to drain. So it's, a, it's an over the month question of whether there's going to be tidal flats there for shorebirds. But right now what we're enjoying is what's there uh, up on the left is, is duck season. And it's been really good for ducks and pintails have been kind of abundant out there lately. The south pans are fantastic. And what is interesting to me, and I'd love to hear your comments on this at some point, um, is how different the, the birding is just south of that particularly big pan we call the main pan, and how special stuff shows up in the south pans. Um, this is a Hudsonian godwit that was there this fall. Um, and I should say, by the way, that if a photograph has a name on it, that's who took the picture, otherwise they're mine. Um, and I also want to say that um, these people whose names are up there, um, I just feel so grateful for all the photographers that go bird watching with me so that I can explain again how a semi pollinated sandpiper is different from this or that. Um, and um, because they're taking the photographs and posting them in our eBird list. So it's really, really helpful. Um, so it's delightful to work with them over the years. But the South Pans tends to get some um, special stuff that shows up. And then when we've had this chance to see ducks or shorebirds or marsh birds or marsh raptors, um, many times we'll stop for just a few um, minorly interesting ducks at the main pan or the south pans. And then we find ourselves staying there for half an hour in winter in particular, because that is just a great place to stand and see winter raptors. And uh, this year, there are no snowy owls. Oh, well. Uh, presumably, we won't have three really low years of snowy owls in a row, and next year we'll have a few anyway. Um, and we really haven't had too many uh, sightings of rough-legged hawks, and some years you see three lots of times. Uh, have, fortunately, harriers have been good, and as, uh, as was mentioned, uh, uh, short-eared owls have really become uh, wonderful lately. But you leave this open area of the marsh, and then you go into the famous S-curves, which it's, they feel S-y when you're driving along. It sort of feels like you're kind of, but when you look at it on the map, they're not really much of an S. It's sort of like the wiggles or something. Anyway, um, what is special about the S-curves and Hellcat? What makes them sort of the spring migration capital spots um, is the trees that grow there. And so the larger trees that are there, the oaks, um, the, the um, black gum, the other species that get fairly big, but especially those oaks, um, there's a mix of trees that are stunted because of a lack of water, the sandy soil, the rest of the island where trees even can grow. And what's happening here is there's enough of a lens of water that trees can get a little bit more height, right? So we have these bigger pieces of forest where the birds will show up. And um, when oaks are kind of slow about producing leaves and the caterpillars are getting hungry and you can see the warblers um, in those buds, it's just the most delightful thing possible. And um, I just, uh, you know, have, of course, have to have these photos of some warblers out there that we're all looking forward to in another couple of months. Um, I should have a photograph in here of how I know when a fallout's going to come, and I'm going to tell you how I know when a fallout's going to come, and you can tell me I'm full of it and how you know, and that's fine. Um, but what I've been doing fairly successfully lately is just looking at weather underground. Yes, I look at Cornell's um, bird cast, so I kind of have a sense of overall regional magnitude of birds that are coming, but if you see that 10 day forecast in one of the apps that shows has a graph of wind and it has the little arrows of which way the wind's going. And you see a lot of easterly wind that means we're not going to see a lot of warblers. Do you remember those times when you're hearing your friends in the, the uh, Connecticut Valley or the Hudson Valley going, it's amazing, the warblers. And you're going to Plum Island and you're not really seeing many warblers. And it's just all in there when the wind is keeping birds from the coast. But then something can happen where it turns around and you can see that coming in those forecasts, sometimes correct forecasts. And um, I've showed up there with Mark, he's here and he was there with me that morning where we said that was gonna happen on a Tuesday and it was just a bomb went off and it's really great. So watch those surface winds in conjunction with the regional forecast and go see this. Um, I love wardens for a lot of reasons. 
the history of the refuge, the fact that people had to protect the place. Um, I don't, I, I would like to hear if anybody here has stories of how much they had to protect it. Did they have to use guns? Um, but it was a sanctuary uh, that Mass Audubon was given. Actually, it was given to the uh, New England Federation of Bird Clubs, and then that merged with Mass Audubon. So it was a Mass Audubon property, a lot of the south end of the island, um, then sold after a bit of controversy, as you can imagine, uh, to the federal government to form the Wildlife Refuge, which really um, meant that we didn't have a lot of management to do and it, we get to go bird watching there. So it all worked out for Mass Audubon. Um, but Wardens is wonderful um, because it has that history. Now it's maintenance sheds, um, but because of sparrows, it's the sparrow spot. And this year we didn't have really great sparrow migration. I don't know what you guys think, but I, I felt that there weren't as many big flocks of chipping sparrows to sift through for those clay colored sparrows that you can find in there. But that's a fun thing to do. And it's because of what happens to your brain. I think about brains a lot. Um, it's what happens to your brain when suddenly you can perceive a species you couldn't perceive before that's really subtle like that. So you can stand in that gravel beyond those buildings at these little flocks in October of, um, of migrating spizelid sparrows and then perceive that perfectly good clay color sparrow that's in there with them or be completely delighted and surprised by a lark sparrow or some other crazy thing that happens to show up. But most years a lark sparrow shows up there in my experience. Do it, go, next, do it. All right, moving on to more North Pool Overlook and these sites are close together and we like to make a loop during that one time in the year when the National Wildlife Refuge system lets you walk the dikes. Um, the fun thing about North Pool Overlook is lots of fun things. And lately, it's been really fun for a pair. OK, I can't say this. I asked Paul Roberts if I could say a pair of short-eared owls, and he said, no. You can't say two short-eared owls you're seeing every day flying together are a pair. There are two short-eared owls that have been flying around out there together. And according to Paul, you can't say a pair. And that's fine. I'm just letting you know that, even though two things can be considered a pair in some, some settings. <laughs> but crazy stuff happens at North Pool Overlook. It, it always has been a good place in winter uh, at, in, at sunset to stand there and wait for short-eared owls to come out. The short-eared owls that arrived a couple of months, a month and a half or so ago, um, have been flying around both at once at the spot around here and also straight across the marsh um, in Rough Meadows Wildlife Sanctuary and Stackyard Road. So both of those places, these owls have, presumably it's two owls that have been going back and forth between them, but we don't know that for sure either. Anyway, really fun, whoops, um, really fun things happen. And that is a fun thing right there, okay. It's funny that at the north end of North Pool from North Pool Overlook, um, it seems to be a good spot for the occasional common gallinule. But what was really special about that particular one that lingered for quite some time is we caught that common gallinule eating Phragmites leaves. And I was trying to get somebody to capture that bird and breed it like a lot, <laughs> but nobody seemed ready to do that. So it was just an anomaly that we caught on, on film. Um, Really good place to see harriers too. And of course, it is a good place for short eared owls. And um, I think it's just the height, the, the width of the marsh there. I don't know. It just is a good place to see short eared owls. Very lovely. It's also a really good place for tree swallows when tree swallow season comes. And tree swallow season is one of the wonders and the spectacles of Plum Island. Um, these are tree swallows that we love by the thousands and occasionally up towards what we think is around 100,000. Although I have been learning more and more lately about estimating large numbers. And what I mostly have been learning is how bad we are at it and, and how the bigger the numbers are, the worse we are at, at estimating them, which is something I, I look forward to working on. In any case, there are a lot of tree swallows. Um, and they like being up there at that end, and that's where they, that area is where they roost at night. Um, and, you know, there has to be a little moment. It's not like there's one spot for tree swallows on Plum Island, but there does need to be a moment in a presentation like this to pause and, and think about them when they come in their hordes. Um, 
they're eating all the fruit that they can get to fatten up and all the bugs that, that are there. I personally believe, I have observed, that when greenhead flies really are declining, tree swallows are arriving and flying all over the salt marsh. Are they doing that? We don't know. Occasionally, very sadly, a tree swallow gets killed on Plum Island. You just find, you see roadkill, not many. I mean, people generally, that's why you should drive slowly out there is because you're not supposed to hit the wildlife. But one of these days, I'm gonna see one of those tree swallows and I have a salvage permit and I'm gonna see if Nancy Powell will find out what's in the stomach if it's during that greenhead fly time. But I don't know if that's ever really gonna happen. Anyway, it's something we wonder. Um, the thing that happens though, aside from them flying around everywhere, um, and those are all tree swallows there, um, is the nighttime roost. And so you need to know that 15 minutes after sunset, if you arrive right at sunset, but if you get there by 15 minutes, this is to the minute, after sunset onto the Hellcat Dyke, you can see them settle in for the night and they go through a series of pretty much regular shenanigans out there, various kinds of flights they have, and it's a spectacular, uh, display that you really can't miss. So if you haven't been there in the evening to see that, make sure you do, because um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic to see them settling in for the night. They, they seem skittish about really just flying in to roost, um, and there's a lot of movement um, during which they sometimes are predated by peregrine falcons. Um, so uh, it's, it's really neat to watch them try to avoid predation and find a safe place to be for the night. Um, you don't have to go there at night, and I don't know if my video is going to play, but maybe the person in the booth can press, look at that. Um, these experiences we have with wildlife uh, on Plum Island um, do change a person. Um, and I hope all of you have been next to or in the middle of what I refer to as a swallow vortex flying in, in a circle in an open area. Um, you don't need much explanation uh, to just really be, um, feel like you're a better person for seeing something like this. Really, really fabulous. And how lucky is it to be leading a bird walk and see something like that? Really, really great. Okay. All right, well, moving along. Um, and, and that spot was parking lot three, okay? But that sort of thing happens a lot at Hellcat, south of Hellcat, lots of places that those vortices uh, get going. Um, moving along to uh, to really kind of the epicenter of birds um, down at the end of North Pool and in the Hellcat Wildlife Observation Area. Um, this is uh, the famous place to go, the main place to go. If you if it was a nice spring day and you only had one place you could go, this is where you'd go. Um, and the reason for that is that you have all the delights of things that might be in the freshwater impoundments or on the salt marsh. Um, and then this really developed forest that concentrates birds that do end up on the island and are trying to find the best food they can before they leave the island. Um, the, the forest is taller there, forest is more diverse there, and so it gets concentrations of migrating birds in the spring that are absolutely fantastic. Um, I really want to thank any of you who were part of the Friends of the Refuge group that helped get this boardwalk built because it is fantastic. Um, and uh, my friend Mark, who's in the back there, is demonstrating one of the best tricks you can do out there. When that bird is just around the tree a little bit that way, you can hook your foot under that railing and you can actually lean out. You didn't used to be able to do that. And, and, in, mo and in many cases would walk backwards off of it or whatever. Um, so that's one of the really great improvements. But of course, the real improvement is that I think most, most everybody I saw come in here tonight walked in just fine. Um, but my really close friend from graduate school who has MS and has gone from a walker to a wheelchair can't walk around there just fine. And he loves that place. And we take him there every year. And we used to have to carry him up over all those stairs. And now he glides. And it's, it just fills your heart. It's really, really great that it's ADA accessible. So I appreciate what the refuge has done. Um, that is the birdiest bathroom in America, as they say, right there uh, below the dike. That bird itself is one that we named Champ 
because it was one of those unbelievably um, color saturated Baltimore Orioles. You know, they vary a bit. And this one had just this extra reddish orange right down the center of its chest. And, um, and so I've re recorded that bird so that I can see if it will return because Orioles make a unique song. And so we might know if Champ is still around um, if he comes and breeds again and we wanna see him. But he was certainly breeding in one tree that was there by the bathroom one year for a few years. Okay, let's do it. You can go, there were too many. I don't know what happened. Okay, I'm fighting with the booth. All right, um, when we go bird watching for three hours on Plum Island, lots of times we do lots of things and somehow we often try to end on that stretch of, uh, of the dike at Hellcat and it's weird how something magical will pop up up there. Um, raise your hand if you ever had that magical last bird at Hellcat Dyke. Yes, it is, it is a thing. Um, it really happens. And um, you never know what it's gonna be. It could be tons of shorebirds in Phil Bill Forward Pool. It could be the, the family of uh, Lee Spitterns that seems to breed in the Phragmites every year that all decide to come out at once. And you see the babies with the little funny pieces of down sticking up off their head. Um, it's, it's really a fabulous place for finding unusual species and lots and lots of birds. Um, there was that year when there was a recidivist snowy owl. It was back in the prison again. Um, we don't usually walk up on the, on, the, on the tower that much. I don't know why, but um, you know, I don't know. He was up there. Do it, go, there we go. Um, then there's the blind. And if you are like most people, you go bird watching on Plum Island, uh, you know, with a few friends. But when I take a big group of people out there, the blind is tricky, right? Because um, it's not very big. Putting 25 people in there gets pretty interesting. Um, they have to be fairly friendly. In any case, um, I essentially look at Bill Ford Pool's blind, the blind there as the um, shorebird treasure hunt um, it's tough in the afternoon. Um, you want to be at Bill Forward Pool, which is a high tide roost for shorebirds. It's one kind of high tide roost for shorebirds, I've come to learn. And um, I feel silly that I just went bird watching all the time and saw lots of birds at what I considered high tide roosts, like Bill Forward Pool, like the main pan, if the water's gone, and just thought that's what we get. That's what high tide roosts look like the mud flats and creeks, the mud out there is covered. So the shorebirds go in there and that's our shorebirds. Well, a lot of the shorebirds that are roosting at high tide have filled their bellies and are huddled together in the dunes, which is something I learned this past year from Jeff Denoncourt. So I'm gonna be digging into that a lot more in the future that a lot of roosting that happens at high tide isn't foraging birds in Bill Forward Pool. It's actually, we're just digesting food here and saving energy, which is really interesting. But we don't walk on the beach during this time of year because it's often still closed. So uh, that's something we're gonna wanna learn about. In any case, it is a treasure hunt. There's an American golden plover to prove it. Okay. Um, the pines is pretty wonderful. Uh, another experience, and maybe this is confirmation bias, but my experience is that something special pops up in the pines. Um, there's so many birds and so many birders at Hellcat that you have to sometimes go to the pines because that's all there is. Um, and then something special will pop up or like that, that hooded warbler that was just standing in the middle of the path that time. You know, that sort of thing uh, happens in the pines quite a bit, but it is a good place um, to see birds that like pines, like guess what, pine warbler. Um, but in any case, um, parking lot five. What I wanna say to birders uh, who, who need a place to park is that, I'm giving this away, okay, for free, is that parking lot five is usually a place you can even take a group, like Wednesday morning birding when we have 10 cars um, and get a spot to park. And then you can even walk back to Hellcat if you need to. So don't forget about parking lot five in the spring. Go. Come on. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, isn't it funny how the South Marsh is kind of quiet? Why is the South Marsh so quiet? You know, you go through the South Marsh and there could be a snowy owl out there, 
Um, but we tend to just kind of scoot by while looking for, in winter, looking for, um, looking for northern shrikes in the shrubbery along there, and that's a good thing to do. But as you approach Cross Farm Hill, um, that's where you start to think, okay, maybe something's gonna happen. Because in winters, when we have rough-legged hawks up and down the island, sometimes two or three of them sort of setting up shop out there, um, Cross Farm Hill is a really good place for kiting. And um, rough-legged hawks are tundra breeders. Um, and they are a beautio. And they kite really, really well. And red-tailed hawks can kite, right? You see red-tailed hawks kiting when the west wind is coming and hitting the, the forest out there and making a wave or hitting Cross Farm Hill or other sites like that. Uh, red-tailed hawks will find a spot where they can, they're not hovering, they're hovering when they're expending energy, but they're kiting when they're staying still in a spot where they can see food. Um, here's another admission. I, I get to do these admissions all the time. Um, we had a falconer come to Joppa Flats one day, and she was talking about how she trains red-tailed hawks. And th there's this sort of deal where if you have a falconer's license, you can trap a, an immature red-tailed hawk once a year, um, and then you teach it to hunt or help it learn to hunt, um, take good care of it, and then it has a much better chance of surviving because you tend to rewild them within a couple of years, and they're really good at becoming wild birds. They'll just sort of take off and forget about you or leave people alone. So that was really interesting. What she said was that when uh, red-tailed hawks are looking for food, they're sitting in a tree. So when we're driving along the highway and we see all those hawks, you know, they're, they're looking for that, they're foraging. That is their foraging strategy, to sit there and wait for a squirrel or a bunny or a whatever run by and then jump on it, which actually makes a whole lot of sense. And it seems like kiting is being still and waiting for something to move that you can eat. Well, rough-legged hawks really like to do that. They like to do it at Cross Farm Hill and other sites with good wind updrafts, which can be up and down the whole island. They will sometimes just slide down the forest edge uh, all down the island. And one imagines that they have to be good at it if they're a beautio and wants to want to just drop down on something and eat it. And they, they raise young in a place where there are no trees. So that's been my little supposition. It's kind of fun to think about. Next slide, please. Um, Stage Island Pool and Parking Lot 6 and Ipswich Bluff are a complex that um, can provide endless fun. Um, Obviously, we're now going to find out what's going to happen when Stage Island Pool becomes a, a tidal flat uh, in the future. And that's something that I'm going to invite people to participate in, in observing really closely. Um, let's go to the next slide because the thing isn't working. But in late summer, um, it, the, the amazingness begins. Really, what, what, what happens in our summer is that you know how birds get kind of broody and quiet in July and, and the greenheads come out and we don't even go, and there's beachgoers, and you can't bother with it. But actually, shorebird migration begins in mid-July. Mid and, um, and when the post-breeding dispersal happens from the breeding colonies of wading birds in our region, which are now, I understand, really kind of two main areas, which are south of Cape Ann along the shore there on the islands, that many of which Mass Audubon um, uh, manages and owns, as well as on the Isles of Shoals. When those wading birds are, are fledged, they come into the marsh and then they hang out for a long time. So this is one of the great places where they do that, Stage Island, along with the growing southward migration of shorebirds that are doing their leisurely thing. And next slide, please. So um, Stage Island Pool becomes this just wonderful thing um, in the what? 50% of the years where an avocet shows up? Or is it 65? I don't know. I'm looking at Robert, like, Robert, what do you, how many, how off? Most, it seems like a lot of years we get one avocet to the point where I'm starting to wonder, is that a, a particular avocet? Um, we have no way of knowing that uh, unless something happens and we do, uh, but right now we don't. Um, but it's really nice when an avocet shows up there because um, that makes it easy to have a happy group of bird watchers when I'm leading a bird watching tour. Um, and then there's all the, all the shorebirds that can be there. It's weird how Stage Island Pool, when it's drained in management in order to make it good for shorebirds, can be a decent place to see a lot of shorebirds and sometimes really special ones, um, if you want to call that a shorebird or is it a wader. In any case, um, 
But one thing I've learned from Nancy is that the substrate of Stage Island Pool is really poor in macroinvertebrates for them to eat. So even though we do see them there, there isn't as much food there as at Bill Forward Pool uh, from a study that she did a, a long while back. In any case, just interesting. Okay, next slide. Um, but here we have this post-breeding dispersal of, of wading birds. Um, I haven't yet seen an actual overnight roost at Stage Island for them. Um, maybe that's because there's so many other roosts that I'm getting to before I would even make it down there. But um, we have a big one down the street from Joppa Flats in Perkins Park, which I probably should have had in this show because in late summer you should go to Perkins Park in Newburyport right down the street from Joppa Flats, bring your, your picnic and watch hundreds of egrets uh, fly in because it's beautiful and occasionally a few other little um, you know, special birds. But they really hang out in Stage Island Pool um, along with the Abisset, and it's a wonderful thing. Ipswich Bluff, what a gift that was when they opened the trail to Ipswich Bluff. It was just so wonderful that that got opened up. Um, I, I was a little leery of the idea of taking my constituency all the way to the end of Ipswich Bluff, and that can actually be challenging it's a mile um, and if we and this year we finally did it we walked all the way to the end of Ipswich Bluff and there were about four birds on the water and that was not what we were looking for um, but in general um, Ipswich Bluff is um, a pretty fantastic place to see seabirds up close much like the north end of the island there's a very deep channel there right at Ips, at, at the bluff and so you can get really close up views of them um, moving by. Um, there are, there's a mussel bed under there, so you very often see them wrestling mollusks. Um, common eiders, scoters of all three species, not as many blacks, but you know, there's even surf scoters in there. Um, and you'll see them swallowing mussels and clams um, right in front of you, and that's charming that they can swallow a whole clam and crush it in their gizzard. So that's what they're doing there, and you can see it live. Next, please. And then um, right down the street is really kind of one of our favorite places on the island in the wintertime, if the tide is right. We're going to come back to tides in just a second, um, where we park at parking lot seven, which can be good for dabbling ducks if it's dabbling duck time to go up on the, um, the tower there and see all the, the many, many ducks that are in the back of Stage Island Pool. Um, but really, it's the birds that seem to like to be around the rocks. We don't have a lot of rocks on Plum Island, so rocks make a special habitat that attracts birds that we really enjoy seeing. So next slide, please. Um, so this was a good moment. There are lots of good moments like this. Uh, a whole lot of black scoters out there. I'm guessing that that tide height is about six or a little over six feet. Next slide, please. But this is what you need to know. Um, so earlier I was talking about how to predict when shorebirds are coming in on the, sh on the flats at, at Joppa Flats, and that's at one foot on the Newburyport uh, gauge. Notice that this is the Plum Island South gauge. So when you move around, the, the app knows where you are if you give it that permission, and it just goes to the nearest tide gauge, which are all over the place. There's one at uh, the Route 1 in Newburyport. There's one at the Merrimack River entrance. There's one that I never bother with called Salisbury Point somewhere in there. Um, and then there's Plum Island South is a really important one because it's kind of the main tide gauge that we use to know what's going on even in a lot of the marsh when we're, we're doing marsh work. Um, and so here's a big disappointment. Like if you take, okay, let's go up to Emerson Rocks and see some cool birds. No, because Emerson Rocks is not there. It's covered by a particularly high tide and you're all disappointed, although it is nice to look at the ocean, don't forget. Okay, next. Okay, the minute there's a rock, there's a cool bird. Okay, and it's a female eider, and I like eiders a lot, even though they're very common birds for us in the wintertime, but this one was doing a good show by saying, I really want to stand on a rock. Okay, so even though this is it, I'm doing it, and she got Actually, this is recently when I was getting photos for this show, and uh, she was getting knocked off of there and getting back up on there, and it was just a show. So Emerson Rocks is really great. So you do want to watch the tides, 
Um, this is about six feet. I actually think something was going on barometrically or with wind that day because I think that's a little high for six feet. Six feet's like a little more rocks showing down there. But watch the tide chart for the places that you like. There was that year when at an outgoing tide, a gyre of about two and a half thousand seabirds would form right up against Crane Beach and you could see them from across at Palm Island and it was cool. So just learn these things. That one, that phenomenon went away. All right, next slide, please. Um, so this is why you wanna get there on time, right? Um, we went out there one day and this snowy owl brought in, who's going to identify its prey? Anybody wanna work on that? Robert's really tilting his head. I think he's, well, I don't know. Um, anyway, it was pretty exciting to see this bird coming in with that. Um, so there were enough rocks, there was prey. And, and it's really when the rocks appear that the birds seem to get there for foraging and it gets um, really busy. So you wanna be, this is a perfect time. Um, here it is just a, a little lower, five and a half feet um, with maybe, maybe there was a west wind that day blowing the water out a little bit. So it's a little lower than, than usual, but in any case, um, there's a whole zone beyond the rocks. There's the cove within the rocks. Horned grebes really like it in there. Um, and scoters and eiders really like it on the outside. Along weirdly with, that is a spot where you almost always see common golden eyes. And what's up with that? They like it there. What's up with that is likely food, that there's some kind of food that is good for them there. Um, and bar head. Don't forget bar head. I think well, aside from the fact that some years there's been a, um, a bank swallow colony in the, in the bank there, not, and I think not every year, but many years there's a bank swallow colony there. Um, what Barhead particularly is good for, it's right next door to Emerson Rocks, um, is the flybys. Because when the tide goes down and Emerson Rocks appear, birds are coming out there. Or conversely, as they get covered, birds are heading into the sound often. And so we just see this enough that I feel like you go to Bar Head so that you can be standing there while the birds are flying by and get these amazing in-flight shots that John Lynn is particularly good at. Next. Um, and we're almost at the end here with a, another little message uh, to finish up. But um, Sandy Point is a wonderful place to enjoy piping plovers and a wonderful place to enjoy these turns that we should, of course, look at because they're wonderful. Um, since we can't really get too close to them up and down the beach of the island where they have a very safe place to raise their babies as far as human disturbance, um, we are able to see them up there if there's enough of a rack platform for them to nest in, which comes and goes. There was one year when a lot of terns were getting ready to nest on Sandy Point, a storm came in and wiped the whole thing out and they all moved over to Crean Beach. <laughs> and I had to have a few words with trustees to talk about them stealing our birds. But in any case, um, it's a good place to go. And there was that uh, lesser blackback gull that was there in the winter for years. There was, I, can we agree that it was a lesser blackback gull that was there at high tide roosting most days? Wasn't it a glaucus gull that was at Hampton Beach State Park on that one cupola on the bathroom? every day, right? That was one bird that was doing that. Well, that lesser blackback gull moved on to better things, I guess. Anyway, other things pop up there, but it really is good for um, gulls and terns and in migration, um, if there's a, a blow, you wanna get out there to see some special terns like roseate terns and arctic terns and stuff like that. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so we're sort of at the end of this little march, but Look at all those points. How many points did I talk about? There's a lot more points. So um, we made this map, Dave Larson, by the way, I wanna really just thank Bill Getty and Dave Larson for learning all this stuff and teaching it to me so I could teach it to people. Um, and Dave Weaver and all the other amazing volunteer bird leaders of Mass Audubon that have helped me learn all this stuff. Um, those are points where you can see cool birds all around the sort of Plum Island, Greater Newburyport area. Um, and these are in the Bird Observer website. And I encourage you to be a, a subscriber to Bird Observer and go and then click these things. And they open up and it tells you about what's there and when and what it's good for. 
And I would, this is where I'm really wanting to engage this audience. I would so appreciate it if some of you, and of course, Jim, I mean, you could just go through the whole thing, um, but could look at some of these places and add to them. Send me notes, you know, dmoon at massaudubon.org. Send me notes about places that are missing um, or about the places we have and special things that you've noticed about them. That would be a really wonderful form of engagement. So that is on the Bird Observer website. Next. Okay, I can't stand here and tell you about Birds of Plum Island without telling you a little bit, just a little brief bit about the incredible amount of work that is taking place on the Great Marsh behind Plum Island and all the other barrier beaches of Essex County and um, up into New Hampshire. Um, the reason why we're like it made sense for me to become a coastal resilience manager and help this new process of doing landscape level ecological restoration, not just on our property, but off our property, um, and being part of a collaboration with other organizations and government agencies um, to make this happen, is that we're going to lose the Great Marsh. Um, it's a very special marsh in you know, lots of characteristics that I won't delineate now, but the reason why we're gonna lose it is sea level rise primarily, but secondarily, um, something that didn't cause problems for a long time and now is. And that is the leftover um, sort of ruins of the amazing agricultural activity that took place for hundreds of years after European colonists arrived um, in North America. Um, at its height, it was an unbelievable industry in which the goal was to raise the yield of Spartina patents, salt marsh hay, to raise those yields um, by up to four times, to get four times as much hay off of the salt marsh um, and to maybe preclude other species to select for that species, which was more nutritious for animals. So this is a painting that actually came down from someplace in Canada, showing the embankments that people built building in water control structures of embankments and then little control structures under the embankments to ditches to control water so that you could have high marsh grass everywhere because it was money. And so that was a big industry into the 1800s um, and it profoundly changed the marsh. It's why when you look at pictures from space or from an airplane of the marsh, it looks like that on the right. Um, individual little squares. If you've been to any of those history presentations, the whole thing got gridded up and given to different people to go out and get their hay. And it was a long history of um, using the marsh for agriculture. It was a farm. Okay, well, here's a beautiful salt marsh. We go out there, I went out there. It's beautiful, it's wild, it's not. What we're looking at is high marsh Spartina patterns in the foreground. Um, what we consider low marsh Spartina alterniflora or cord grass in the background, that tall, spikier looking stuff. And without going into a long lecture about salt marsh ecology, um, essentially we have a 12 foot tide range. And the difference between the lowest high tide and the highest high tide in this area is about three feet. Okay. And so um, when the lowest high tides happen, they're often flooding that part of the marsh where the Spartina alterna floor is. But the Spartina patens doesn't get flooded as often. Um, around half of the time above the average high tide is where Spartina patens starts to come in. And we call that high marsh and the other part low marsh because it is a little higher. And in the salt marsh, millimeters matter of what species are gonna grow there. Well, what difference does it make what grass grows? It's pretty green grass. Well, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, here's a picture of Ref Meadows Wildlife Sanctuary um, in which all of the embankments have been delineated. And this has been ground truth. It's been done by a genius called, uh, named Jeff Wilson, who's amazing at this, um, where he's designing restoration of the problems that we're having out there that I'll show you in a minute. Um, but those are all embankments in about a 200, little more than 200 acres. Um, the orange ones are early period. In the early colonial days, they kind of did it a little more willy-nilly. And then by the 1800s, they were getting extremely organized about it. And it looks like a city with all the embankments. 
These are the ditches. That's a lot of stuff in a small area. The entire marsh is this way, ditches and old embankments. Now the embankments that you saw in that painting, it's not, it doesn't look like that anymore. Let's keep going. Next slide, please. Thank you. Here's an old embankment. You, you would barely notice it unless you really start to see this stuff. Um, it's a change in vegetation in a stripe. And lots of times the old embankments don't even have such a, a noticeable difference. But they only have to be a few, uh, just a couple few centimeters higher and more dense to grow different vegetation. And with increasing sea level rise, more water getting over that embankment, flooding the marsh behind that embankment more often that might have been high marsh in the past. Now water goes over it more often and the water can't drain off as easily and it's killing vegetation. So we're getting this thing that we used to call high marsh dieback. It's really just where the marsh has drowned, where the vegetation has died because it can't tolerate that much flooding. Uh, Spartina patens can't tolerate flooding the way Spartina alterniflora can. And another thing that happens behind the embankments is that a, a, a variety of Spartina alterniflora, that cord grass, that's a short form, not the tall stuff you saw before, grows in and vast areas of the marsh that might have been Spartina patens in the past are now this short-term alterniflora. Again, what difference does it make? We'll get to that. Um, so there are these dead zones and we're losing vegetation, which means that when the roots really die, we're gonna have subsidence there. Next slide, please. Um, we, it doesn't show well with the lighting in here, but um, the dark areas there are growing mega pools along Patmos Road there. Um, really, really saturated and vegetation has changed. Um, too many ditches. What too many ditches does is that um, the water can drain out of the groundwater in the peat of the marsh, can drain out more because of all those drains. Um, and that means that when the water drains out, the groundwater drains out, it sucks air into the, into the salt marsh peat and it decomposes faster. And so you have subsidence because of too many ditches. You have drowning in pools because of the embankments. So fortunately, we are having ways we can um, remediate that. What, that we're now typically calling salt marsh restoration. There are three techniques that I'm going to show you. That was the big pilot that trustees did at Old Town Hill, very successful years ago. This is the 100 acre uh, restoration that Nancy Powell did on the refuge. Um, you know, all these plans for things to do that I'm going to explain real quickly here. And what we're doing are three things, ditch remediation, runneling and microtopography. Ditch remediation, and here's Jeff Wilson, where he has mowed the hay with a walk behind mower. And now he's raking the hay, uh, the, just the salt marsh grass that's there, over to a ditch that's one too many ditches. There's a design that shows, you know, which ones we don't need, which ones we should leave. So he rakes the hay over to the ditch. Um, people, the crew rakes that, pushes that hay into the ditch, just tamps it down in there and then twines it down with biodegradable twine. That's it. Um, and if you do this technique, typically it takes not more than three years to restore that ditch to peat. Um, and peat can take thousands of years to accrete, but in this technique, sediments get trapped in that grass that's held in with the twine as the tides come and go, and it creates conditions that will attract roots of plants and grass starts growing in there and we have healed ditches in three years very often, sometimes less. So we can heal these ditches that there are too many of. And that's really cool because it's a very low impact uh, technique. That's ditch remediation. For the mega pools that are growing everywhere out there, we're creating what we can't use the ditch word. We're creating shallow drainages, no more than a foot deep, um, that drain them. And the befores and afters of that has been really, really dramatic of restoring vegetation into the pools that have expanded and expanded. Um, microtopography is, un, is unproven in terms of its real reason we're doing it. If you dig a runnel, you actually can take very small excavators out there and do that, or shovels. But if when you dig the peat 
out to do that, you got to put it somewhere. So they're making little islands of peat, as you see on the left, um, that is filled with roots of plants. And that's one year later, gro growing grass and plants like crazy. And the idea there is to create high spots for this bird. Salt marsh sparrow is a species that nests on the ground in the salt marsh. It has to have a, they have to have a nest that, um, where they lay the eggs and the young have fledged and can escape the tides in one spring to spring tidal cycle. And with the rising tides we've had, with all that flooding of areas, um, their population is dropping fast enough that um, I think I, could, I might see them go extinct. That is the trajectory they're on, just going extinct. So we have to do something like we've done for lots of species. The micro islands or micro topography are hoped to be, given that the runnels are helping restore vegetation in general, we're hoping that lots of those little micro islands that grow the right kind of grass quickly um, and the right kind of grass is Spartina patens, that that will provide nesting spots for salt marsh sparrows. So that is what we're doing out there. And it needs to happen on, on the entire marsh, the whole thing. So this is at Rough Meadows, the ditches, the embankments, um, the design, the bright blue is to our, our runnels, the blue is actual drainages that exist, and then that sort of dark teal is a, a, a healed ditch. And um, this has been practiced and practiced and now is working well for trustees on their properties and for Nancy Powell on the refuge. And um, we're, we're needing to do it at scale. We're gonna, Mass Audubon's gonna do it, but the state has come in and helped design thousands of acres of this restoration. So that is what we're working on. And here's the thing. Well, here's, here's the design where we eventually get what we think will look like natural former hydrology that can form where the water wiggles across the marsh instead of having to leak slowly through too many ditches. So that's the final res restoration design that's gonna happen out there. Um, the thing about that is that um, regulations are strong to protect the marsh. They're actually kind of getting in the way of our work. Um, most of the marsh is owned in private hands. 87% of the parcels of the Great Marsh are in private hands, and that accounts for about half of the marsh. So we're doing it on the low fruit places and going to get to that other stuff when people agree to let us, which is kind of my job. There's one last thing I'm going to share with you. I'm a little over here, but um, I just uh, want, there's one other place that I think you should go. Um, and I kind of went fast there, but we're going to have this video while, while I wrap up. Um, this is not a safe place to go. You could die. Okay, um, this is, um, I'm standing on the south jetty at the north end of the island. It's a pretty easy jetty to walk on as jetties go, but if you slipped off and banged yourself and fell in that very cold water, you, people die out there with some frequency, usually fishermen when their boat overturns and that sort of thing. Um, but this is a, on an outgoing tide on a calm, beautiful day with a decent surf, and it is just the most sublime experience to stand out there on the South Jetty uh, while the seabirds do their conveyor belt. They fly up the current, settle down, and flow out while they dive for food. And, um, it, and the way the waves interact with the outgoing uh, flow of the water is, is um, mesmerizing. Standing waves and moving waves kind of all at the same time. Um, and so I recommend spending some time out there, uh, just being with those birds. Uh, I, I took some ashes of a friend who asked me to put his ashes in the ocean out there. And so I know he's kind of making that, he's going around and around with those birds out there. So I really, really like it. Um, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. We've, I'd be happy to take a few questions. I know it's getting late, but. Yep. Okay. Where's the question? <laughs> yes. 
Oh, that's a really interesting question. The, the, how, has, how can one get involved in restoration? Um, actually, um, we, what I want to do, as my community science title would suggest, is create ways for um, well-trained volunteers to get data that can have strong impact. We've come up with a way to map the marsh vegetation that is simple enough that I think I could train folks like yourselves. Um, it's dangerous out there on the salt marsh because you can fall into zombie ditches and, um, you know, Robert will tell you those stories. Um, but, but we need to keep very close watch on what happens with this restoration work. So I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to send volunteers out to do some of that mapping um, as, an, as about the next year progresses. You guys already knew all this stuff. Hello? Oh, right down here. Thank you. I'll, I'll repeat it. Oh, right. Or I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. Right. Right. Yeah. And all of the sounds that they make are and they're just saying incredibly that the purple martin. So no doubt. Uh, different times, different places, different times of day. They all provide a different unique experience. I love this place. Thank you. Um so this person for those online was saying how much she enjoys the south end and the unpaved part of the road for, for walking and biking. I will simply recommend that you do that after it rains so that the dust doesn't get you because it, it can be pretty rough with the dust. Anyone else? I can't see as well in the back. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, thanks. How is it going working with the private property owners so far? That's an interesting question, working with the private property owners for restoration. We have inholders in our design at Rough Meadows, so we are working with people there. We're starting with people we know well to work through what will be agreements that they will have to sign to let us do restoration on their land. So that's what we're doing right now is figuring out all the, the details of that. We also really want to work with abutters uh, just so that they're friendly towards it and so that they might sort of join in on restoration that happens next to us. Um, it's really just getting started. Um, eventually, in order for the restoration to work, we're trying to restore hydrologic flow. And if there's a patch in the middle that you can't do it on, that's not going to work as well. So we really need people to get on board. Um, so that's why we start with sort of low fruit. But even starting with uh, low fruit, meaning, you know, NGO land, non-governmental organization land, or uh, municipal land, because the towns are often willing to let us do the restoration. Um, in order to do that, um, we still often have these little patches that you need permission for. So there's going to be a lot of work and a lot of awareness building that we need to do about how we need to work to help the marsh keep up with sea level rise. It's going to be difficult. Okay. Um, Robert had his hand wiggling around, but over here, go ahead. Go ahead. What, was there a question here? Just a qu quick question. Yep. Uh, are there plums on Plum Island? There really are. And um, good, good question. Um, Plum Island is well named. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a shrub out there that makes these little plum like fruits that are delicious and at least some people make delicious things out of them. Um, and um, you can get a permit to pick them on, um, on Plum Island in the Wildlife Refuge. Um, they do grow around all the houses and you know, pretty much all around the area. So you can also find them outside the refuge. But there's a, a, a berry picking 
permit you can get from them uh, that will also allow you to go and collect uh, cranberries. So because there are cranberry bogs out there as well. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, I love that idea the micro topography. Um, have, have, has anyone looked to see if marsh sparrows are actually right using that's that? the, that's the really good question Robert is that um, are the marsh sparrows actually using there aren't enough of them yet. Um, it's kind of I asked Jeff Wilson like so Jeff you know you're making these islands, how's it going, and he said there's just not enough data yet to say. But we, we need to do something with it. The, the good thing is, is that these little micro topography islands grow Spartina patterns like crazy. And salt marsh sparrows only nest in thick Spartina patterns where there's good thatch and they can hide a nest with a nice cup of dead grass that they can make. So um, we're making good places for that. And eventually there's gonna have to be some way to, you know, do a controlled study to see if they're preferentially using them. Um, but you know, remember when blue bluebirds were disappearing and we just started making boxes to see if it would work? Look at all the bluebirds. You know, so I that actually makes me optimistic. And I know that's a little superficial and I don't know, maybe that's a little saccharine to say, well, look at the bluebirds, this will work for the sparrows. We don't know it will work, but we certainly should try. And we know that if those islands are growing salt marsh grass, that's okay. Like the results are not bad for the system to have these higher spots where the good grass grows. That's a good one. Got a yeah. question online. Um, the permit, if the permit is obtained, oh, hold on, I just changed over here. Um, if the dikes are destroyed, will the common gallinule still visit the North Pool? And how about those spectacular tree sparrows? Okay, so this question I think is about the wildlife refuges um, habitat management plan, um, which is uh, the plan is to restore tidal flow to the impoundments on the refuge. Um, and that will change the uh, ecology inside those impoundments, which is now freshwater to tidal. Um, and um, so I think this question was about what will, will common, will birds like common gallinules that prefer fresh water come after that tidal flow has been restored and salinity increases inside the impoundments. And I would have to guess probably not so much. Um, I don't know whether there'll be, it'll tend to be more fresh inside those areas anyway, because the dikes will still be there. It'll just have a hole for the tide to come in and out of. Um, I don't really know that. Um, but I will say regarding, and then there was a question about tree swells, regarding what people might be concerned about with that um, habitat management plan, please look at the frequently asked questions uh, list of, of explanations that came out with the final plan. I read that, it came out like last week or the week before. Um, they did a really good job of answering questions like that. And I really have to refer to these kinds of questions to the uh, refuge staff because they've studied it so carefully and it's up to them to really explain things because they know it better. But I will also say that I've been working really closely with Nancy Powell for years now. And um, she is an incredible biologist with um, a deep passion to have a healthy uh, ecosystem out there. And uh, so I respect her greatly and, and I trust her and, and work with her on projects that are, that are my projects too. So um, I would really look at those frequently asked questions and maybe you'll find what you're looking for. Um, the, the birds, the, the tree swallows are there because of a high amount of fruit that they eat, a, a food that they particularly prefer, which is the um, wax myrtle. So, um, there are places where other places like Plum Island, where huge concentrations like that of tree swallows occur, where there are not such exact spots like North Pool with all the Phragmites out there. And so they will find some place to roost is what um, we are assuming. They'll roost in the bushes, they'll roost in the cattails that might grow in, in a, a new system. We'll have to see what happens. One more. One more question, and then we're gonna rest. Yeah, there was one right here in the front. If you would use the microphone, yeah. First time to a, um, a talk like this. Yep. But I read a book called Braiding Sweetgrass. Right. Beautiful. And it was by a Native American woman. Yep. Is in 
the word that she used for sweet grass sounded like winger sheep. And I'm like, huh. does it grow around here? Does it grow at the marshes? And if it does, does it have a use to the birds in right. the area or something? Well, I'm interested in, um, in the term cord grass, which m indicates to me that it was used for some kind of cordage that people would make, but I don't know. Um, and I will just start by saying, I don't know. Um, I, am, I feel as if that woman was writing about a very different part of the country and therefore, you know, the botany is probably different, but I can't say for sure unless somebody who's a botanist wants to wiggle around and let you know specifically. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. <clears throat>